So then let's get into today's training and I think we have to start by asking and answering the question of, well then, what is a perfect puppy? What is it that we're actually trying to achieve? Is it just a few tricks? Is it just having a relaxed dog well no i think there's much more to that and let's take a very quick second before we dive into what you need to do to understand what it is that you want to get from your training because without knowing where we're going we might just end up getting lost really easily we have to make sure that our puppy has good manners we don't want to have that dog that is just annoying to be around we don't want a dog that has terrible toilet habits we don't want our dog to charge through every door the second that you open it. As you're trying to get their food on the floor, they're jumping into the bowl, knocking food everywhere, jumping up on all of your kitchen surfaces. Every time someone comes to visit your home, they're barking, they're irritating, they're annoying. They're jumping up people, getting muddy paws on all everybody's clothes. We want to avoid that. We want a dog that we can take with us anywhere and for them to not cause any issues because they have great manners. You don't want to be that person in the pub trying to enjoy a nice afternoon in the sun and have a dog that is barking and growling at everybody that walks past, trying to take your dog for a coffee shop visit. And there again, barking at people, jumping up at them. You want to be able to take your dog with you anywhere that you want to take them and for it to be a fun, lovely, joyful experience, not a stressful, anxiety-filled, frustrating experience. We need our dogs to understand what it is that we want from them. So we have to develop good communication skills. We don't want a dog that doesn't understand what it is that we do want from them and what it is that we don't want from them. A dog that doesn't understand those things is a confused dog, is an anxious dog, is going to be a frustrated dog. And again, we want to avoid that at all costs and have a dog that knows exactly what's expected of them. And if we need to communicate to them, stop doing that mate or please could you do this instead mate they understand what that is and they're able to respond accordingly without stress without trauma without frustration without anxiety without fear and without things turning into a nightmare we want a dog that therefore looks up to you for guidance and direction and we can only get there if the dog knows that we can communicate to them in a language that they understand If a dog doesn't know that they can look up to you for guidance and direction, they will start making decisions for themselves. If they find themselves in a stressful situation and they don't know that they can look up to us to find out how to handle this stressful situation, they then start making those decisions for themselves. And we don't want our puppies, we don't want our adult dogs to be making those decisions because the reality is they're rarely the right decision. That is where a huge amount of problem behaviors come from. Reactive dogs, dogs that explode and bark whenever they see another dog, another person, a cyclist, a bus, a lorry going by. That is because they have been stressed out. They're a bit nervous. They're a bit anxious about what it is that they've seen. And they're making a decision on how to act. What we want to make sure we achieve is that if our dogs feel a bit unsure, they're not sure how to react, that they look up to us for guidance and direction and can simply say, hey mum, hey dad, I don't know what to do here. And because of our communication, we can say, don't worry, just do this. And they go, brilliant. I don't need to worry. I know what you mean. I know what that is. And I can do that, no problem. And then finally, we want a dog that can do that, that does what we ask them to do when we ask them to do so. Not only do they need to know that they can look up to us for guidance and direction, not only do we need to be able to communicate to them what it is that we want from them but then they need to be able to actually do it again it doesn't matter if you have all of the best obedience in your living room it only really matters if you can have that obedience when you take your dog out yes your dog can do all the things we want at home can they do that at the pub can they do that at a coffee shop can they do that when you take them for a walk can they do that when we go to visit the vet If that's the case, amazing. You'll have your perfect canine companion. If they can't, it's going to be incredibly frustrating. But again, the good thing is in this masterclass, I'm going to take you through the steps that you need to do to ensure that all of those bases are covered, that you have success in all of those areas, and you will have the dream canine companion that you've always wanted. Now, very quickly, just in case this is the first time we're meeting, I want to briefly introduce myself. I won't talk about myself much, I promise. But my name's William Afferton. I'm a canine behaviorist here in the UK with over a decade of experience of working with some of the most extreme problem behaviors in the world. As I'd seen so many extreme problem behaviors, we also started to see 
why those behaviors kept occurring over and over again. We saw the mistakes that people were making and that then formed our puppy trainer strategy because my mission is to keep all dogs out of shelters and off the euthanasia table. And the best way that we can achieve that is to be able to help owners get it right first time round. Then the dog never needs to get given up to a shelter in the first place and never is at risk of anything even more serious than that. And as part of that mission, I wanted to help more people than just the people here at my canine training center. In the UK, we're renowned for having amazing transformations with problem behaviors and helping people be able to raise their puppies perfectly in person. But we wanted to help everybody around the world. So we started posting things like this online. And I am incredibly blessed, incredibly fortunate to become one of the most followed canine behaviorists in the world. And we have helped literally millions of dog owners be able to raise and train their own perfect canine companions which is why i'm so excited to be here today to help you do exactly the same thing but that is way too much about me let's get back to the training and let's focus on ensuring that you can achieve the same thing yourself and have the dream canine companion of your dreams so then for us to be able to achieve the perfect puppy i want us to make sure that we're focusing on four areas and in this masterclass, we're going to cover all four of those areas so that you know everything that you need to be doing to achieve success to be able to have that success again we've had with millions of people previously and those four things are simple they are obedience that is what most people think of when they think about training their dogs oh, i'm getting a new puppy i need to train it so i need to do sit and i'd like to do some different tricks and and i need to go to a training class and and that'll be it I'm definitely not saying that obedience isn't important because it absolutely is, but it isn't the only thing. And that is a very, very common mistake that people make is they focus on just obedience. They miss out on these other three areas that we're going to discuss so that you don't make that mistake as well. But if people are only focusing on the obedience piece of the puzzle, like we discussed at the start of the training, yes, you might be able to do a little bit of work inside the house but without those other fundamental pieces you can't take it with you and you can't have the dream canine companion you've always wanted and the reality is even if your dog can do loads of different fun tricks when that novelty wears off that will be the last thing that you're concerned about when i get stopped in public with my dogs with people complimenting me on how amazingly trained and behaved my dogs are how they wish that their dogs were as well trained as mine they're not asking about their fancy obedience. They're not asking me that or telling me that because of all the different tricks. They're telling me that because of the basics, because my dog has the basics of obedience and these other areas in place. That's what makes them jealous. Not all the fancy tricks, not all the fancy obedience. The next area, we mentioned it briefly at the start of the video, is manners. Again, yes, we want obedience, but we also want a well mannered dog but obedience and manners aren't all that we want we then want to make sure that our dogs are well socialized and when we put obedience manners and socialization together i call that the trifecta of perfect puppy training you can't achieve the perfect puppy without having great manners great obedience and great socialization they're going to be the key fundamentals when it comes to what we're actually doing with our dogs but again that's just three of the four pieces the last piece is what I call my pyramid to success. And yes, you will have good success if you focus on obedience, socialization, and manners, but you won't have the perfect KI companion if you don't understand my pyramid to success. And again, we're going to cover that in detail later on in this training. So then let's start with looking at obedience. And we did just talk about it in terms of that I don't think you need fancy obedience to have a perfect canine companion not only do i not think that you don't need that i know you don't need that again i get stopped in public all the time with compliments about my dogs and how well trained they are the fact of the matter is is that really they've only got five pieces of obedience that i focus on there might be a couple of others that we'll touch on that are useful but if i just had these five pieces of obedience I know that I can have control of my dogs, be able to take them anywhere with me. And when I pair it with the other things that we're going to talk about means that they are a dream to take with me. So what are those mandatory pieces of obedience? Well, first and foremost, the good old fashioned sit. Now, sit is amazing, not just because it's an easy thing that you can teach. And usually you can teach it on the very first day 
that you get your dog. But sit becomes a fundamental principle of training and living with your dog. And I promise you, it will most likely become the thing that you use the most with your dog. Again, especially when we get out of this puppy stage and we move into adulthood with our dogs and maybe the novelty of training's worn off, the thing that you will be using all the time, every single day, will be sit. Yes, sit is a fun thing that you can teach your dog, but we're going to be using sit all of the time. Let's take an example of what we mean by a well-mannered dog. We meet somebody in public. What would we like our dog to do? Well, we know we don't want them to jump up. So what could they do instead? They could sit, wait patiently with good manners. And when they do so, the person that we've met can come down to them and say, hello. We want meal times to be calm, relaxed, and a nice experience. I can get the food bowl. I can put it down. What I don't want is for the dog to be essentially knocking the food out of my hand. What I can have is a dog that sits, waits patiently with good manners until I tell them that they can have the food. I want my dogs to be able to jump up on the sofa with me and enjoy a film in the evening, but I don't want them jumping all over me when they see fit. What I could have instead is a dog that sits, waits patiently with good manners for me to welcome them up. When I'm taking my dogs out for a walk, I've got three big dogs. When I open the door, I don't want them charging through and knocking me over and maybe the lead slipping out of my hand and them getting free. What I would like instead is a dog that will sit, wait patiently with good manners for me to go through the door and then for them calmly to follow me. Now, I can give you literally countless examples because that is the reality. Sit will be a fundamental principle that you will use every single day and is the guiding principle for a dog that has good manners and a dog that looks up to you for guidance and direction, waits patiently and calmly. The next thing is stay. Now, I love to teach a stay command because what we want is that dog that will sit, will wait patiently with good manners. That is going to be a recurring theme. For them to do that, they need to know that not only do I want you to sit, I want you to stay there until I tell you otherwise. Now, you can have something called an implied stay, which is if I ask you to sit, I also mean to stay. But I find it's much easier, especially if this is your first time training a dog or you don't necessarily have the experience of a professional canine behaviorist and trainer like myself, that teaching a stay just makes that process much easier for you to get it right first time round. So yes, we want our dog to be able to sit, but we also want our dog to be able to stay there It is great for good manners, but it is also brilliant for emergency situations. I have had multiple instances where I've been out in the real world with my dogs off lead and something has happened, like a squirrel running out, like the dog ending up on the other side of a river and they were considering coming back at a really dangerous point and I needed to be able to say, stay there, do not move. Having that ability is incredibly useful for different situations to keep your dog safe and under control in the real world. Next up is a break command, and this is almost the opposite of a stay command. We want our dogs to know that when we ask them to do something, they do that until we tell them otherwise. What is until we tell them otherwise? Well, that might be sit, and then I'm going to tell you to do something else, so you go to that. But we want our dogs to not pick and choose when they're finished. Let's play out an example of what that looks like. I am in a busy environment and something's happening, or I'm at home, this is very common with parents, and you've got young children and they're drawing all over the wall. They've found something really dangerous that you need to go and deal with. What I need to do is be able to say, sit and stay. You need to do that until I tell you otherwise. If that dog thinks it can pick and choose when it is finished doing what I've asked, you do not have a dog that is under control. If I'm out and there's a dog fight happening over there and my dog's off its lead, or maybe I need to go and deal with something like that over there, if I say sit and stay, you stay there until I tell you otherwise. You do not pick and choose when you're finished. Otherwise, that is a slippery slope to a dog that does not listen, does not look up to you for guidance and direction. But for us to be loving leaders, to be fair to our dogs, we need to make sure that we let them know when it is that they're done. Like I say, that might be go from a sit to a recall that we'll talk about in a minute. It might be go from a sit to a heel that we'll talk about in a minute. However, it might be you're finished, you're free, go and be a dog. The way that we do that is a break command. Another classic example of this is at feeding times. I recommend a feeding time drill that you do with your dog every day forever. What that looks like is I'm going to ask the dog to sit and stay. I'm going to put the food bowl on the floor. And even though the food bowl's on the floor, they're not going to have their food 
until they're looking up to me for guidance and direction. And then I'm going to say, break. That lets them know, brilliant, good job. You've done what I asked you to do. You're free to now go about what it is that you want to do. Go and be a dog. Go and do what you need to do. Eat your food. Jump up on the sofa. Jump out of the car. It gives you the ability to say, do this. Now you're free to go and do what you want. That is incredibly important. And again, like, sit, like, stay will be something that you will actually use with your dog every single day. Next up, we have the heel command. Now, if you have watched me for any amount of time, I'm nearly certain that you will have heard me waffling about the importance of taking your dog on a loose lead walk. I do believe it's one of the most important things that you can and should be doing with your dog every single day. To do that, we need to teach our dog what we want by a heel. Now, I'm not talking about fancy competition levels of heel. Just if I say heel, I just need you by my left-hand side I want my, loose, my lead or leash nice and loose, and I want you just not gazing up at me constantly, but just being aware of where I am, just leading the walk. You're following me so that I can navigate us through life. So again, like we discussed earlier, when you see something that might be making you a bit uncertain, you bring that attention back to me. I can guide you through it rather than you making decisions for yourself, which again, tend to be the wrong decisions. So we want to teach that loose lead heel that's incredibly important and then last up we need a really good recall we want to be able to give our dogs some freedom but we want to be able to give them freedom safely the way that we do that is that we teach a rock solid recall command i need you to go from wherever you are now back to me we can do that in the house it can be useful most likely it's going to be most used when you're out on a walk you want to be able to let your dog have a bit of freedom run burn off some energy have some good exercise maybe play with their friends but when the time comes I need you to come back to me first time, every time that I ask. Again, it's incredibly useful, but from a safety perspective, it's mandatory. If you do not have perfect recall with your dog, you should not be letting them off lead in a public environment. Full stop. But that doesn't need to be the case because we can help you teach perfect recall. Which that segues us quite nicely into the next fundamental principle, into the second area of our trifecta to the perfect puppy, and that is manners. Now, we have already talked about the importance of manners, but let's look at that with what we've just discussed with obedience of how that works. We want a dog that is well-mannered. There's a couple of things to that. One of them is things like toilet training. I put that into the manners category. We also want things like threshold manners, where the dog doesn't barge out of the door in front of us. But the most common use of manners is kind of what we alluded to when we were talking about obedience and the importance of a sit, stay, and break command. Again, the most common uh, situation where this occurs with a dog with bad manners, and I'll be completely honest, this frustrates me. If I'm out in public and I'm not dog training, I just want to take my family to enjoy a nice lunch at a pub, and I go into a pub and a dog comes running up to me and jumps up me, and maybe I've made a bit of an effort and they've got muddy paws, and now I've got muddy paws all down my legs, it drives me mad. It's frustrating. It's irresponsible of the owner to do that you've got a duty of care and a responsibility to ensure that your dog is well-mannered however when i'm out in public i love meeting well-behaved well-mannered dogs if that same dog came up to me and just sat waited nicely i'm going to come down i might ask the owner of course but i want to say hello if that's what he wants and he's a nice friendly dog and wants some fuss might do that if i've got some treats on me which as a dog trainer i usually have some tucked away somewhere i might give him a treat it's a completely different experience. It goes from incredibly frustrating, where now I'm a bit annoyed about the owners letting their dog do that to me, to actually sparked an interesting conversation with the owners and our shared love of dogs. It gets a relationship started. Having a well-mannered dog is incredibly important. And the fundamental principle of that, again, is sit, stay, and break. If we're out and we're walking and we want to stop to chat with somebody, having a dog that will just sit, wait calmly and patiently is beautiful. That same example of them not jumping up. There's so many different situations like that that it's incredibly powerful. Little things that people don't think about. How are you going to take your dog to the vet? Are you going to pop them in a crate in the boot like you should? Make sure that they're nice and secure and safe. But what happens when you open the crate? If they're barging past you, even if you think you can control that, you might slip. It might be a wet day. It happens all the time. And your dog has escaped because they didn't have good manners of sitting, waiting patiently. If you come and watch me get my dogs out, we can open the boot and they'll be sat waiting calmly and if I need them to wait in the boot for 10 minutes while I put my boots on or I put my coat on because it's raining they will sit waiting calmly with good manners until I'm ready pop the lead on and then I use my brake command and they can jump out of the car it is an 
absolute game changer. And again, it's those things. I've had that multiple times in a car park. I've opened my boot or trunk for our American friends. I've sat on the edge of the trunk. Dogs are just sat waiting calmly and patiently behind me. I've put my walking boots on. I've put my coat on. And people have gone, your dogs are so well trained. They're so well behaved. I wish my dog would do that. My dog would never do that. And it's just basic manners. And it's that stuff that when the novelty of puppyhood and puppy training wears off, when you're just living day to day with your dog, is the stuff that you will be so thankful that you've taught to your dog. And that's why I'm going to keep banging on about it because it is so important. It's life-changing. It's revolutionary for you and your dog. And then you can be a shining light out in the community with your friends and family and strangers around you of what good dog training and ownership should look like. And it isn't fancy competition agility, fancy competition protection work, fancy competition heel. It's just having a well-mannered, calm dog, which nicely takes us to socialization. What is socialization? Most people by now know that it is important to socialize their dogs, and it is important to socialize your dogs. But what a lot of people make the mistake of thinking is that what socialization is, is I'll just take my dog to loads of places and just let them free, and they'll just experience it and socialization. That isn't the case whatsoever. If we want to go a little bit fancy behavior y for a second, what socialization actually is, is desensitizing our dogs to different triggers in their environment to be that sights smells sounds you name it different people different places different smells in the environment different traffic different levels of busyness different dogs you name it that can be a trigger for your dog and if they haven't encountered it before it's natural for them to be what is that i have never seen a broom before that broom looks a bit scary And if they don't look up to you for guidance and direction, they don't have good manners, they don't have basic obedience, they might go, I think I need to kill that broom. And they might then go and attack brooms and now they've got a problem with brooms. But if you've uh, socialized your dog well, desensitize them to triggers, oh, that's just a broom. Just kind of chill, just, what is it you want, mum? Sit here, be a good, well-mannered, relaxed dog. Yeah, I can do that, no problem. Now with obedience you could still keep your dog under control, even if they're terrified of that broom. But then your dog sat there doing its obedience, going, oh my God, and they're fearful and they're stressed and they're anxious. What we want is a dog that's just happy, calm and content. And that is where good socialization comes in. It has a multitude of different amazing benefits, but it's not just benefits for you. It's incredible benefits for your dog so the way that you go about socializing your dog again it isn't just taking them everywhere we want to slowly build them up to all different types of sight sounds smells and environments but the important thing is is that we don't just take them and do nothing we take them and we bring that focus to us slowly but surely yes we've done it in our house you can focus on me you're desensitized to everything going on in the house you well socialized here so you can bring your attention to me. We can work on obedience. We can work on manners. But can you do that when you go to a pub? Can you do that when you go to a coffee shop? Not if you don't socialize them well. But does that mean that we immediately take our dog to Times Square the second they've had their vaccinations? No, no, it doesn't. We build up to that slowly. We build that level of distraction, those levels of triggers, and we're working on things. Keep your attention on us. Don't worry about that thing over there. I know it's new, just focus on me and everything's okay. And they go, oh, I saw that thing and it wasn't a big deal. I focused on mom, I focused on dad. Everything was brilliant. That thing over there, that's cool, chill. Tick that off, then we go up a level, then we go up a level. And it does take time, weeks, going to months, and you are technically always socializing your dog. It's impossible to socialize them to absolutely everything. I have not socialized my dog to a clown riding a unicycle, juggling bowling pins on fire whilst balancing a big sword on its chin. I haven't been able to socialize my dog to that as a puppy. However, I've socialized them to so many things and they have learnt, even if they saw a clown on a unicycle juggling fire bowling pins with a sword on its chin, it'd go, that is really weird. I've never seen that before, but every time I have seen something new, All I've had to do, focus on dad. And dad tells me what I need to do. And I know what he's saying. Heal, sit, come back to me. It's all easy. And it's never been an issue. It's always been fine. So even though that's new, I'm going to revert to what I do know. Focus on dad. He's my loving, amazing leader. And he'll navigate me through this so I don't need to worry. That is the essence. When we get that locked down, 
with all three of those things together, manners, socialization, obedience, in the middle where they join the perfect puppy of your dreams if we focus on our pyramid to success. So then what is the pyramid to success? Well, the pyramid to success is more about you. It's more about you as the owner. Our trifecta, our manners, our obedience, our socialization, that's the thing that the dog needs to know. That's what we need to teach the dog. What we need to focus on is ourselves. And we need to become high-level loving leaders because if we really love our dogs, we should lead our dogs because that's what dogs crave. And therefore, leadership is love. But let's break that down and really understand what it actually means. Now, for me, the pyramid to success has three levels. The bottom level is going to be your leadership skills. Now, this can range from zero to no leadership skills to 100 perfect leadership skills. But that is always the foundation. That is the bottom of the pyramid. What that does is it informs the next level, which is always going to be there. Regardless of the leadership skills, we have to move up the pyramid, which is the relationship that you inform with your dog. Now, if your leadership skills are non-existent, if you have bad leadership skills, you are going to have a relationship with your dog regardless. The problem is, is that that relationship will be a dog that doesn't see you as a loving leader because your leadership skills aren't there. However, if you develop your leadership skills, that will mean that your relationship is informed by your leadership skills where your dog does see you as a loving leader which then takes us to the tip of the pyramid. This could be the tip of the iceberg that's poking out above the water with relationship and leadership under the water that most people don't see. But that tip of the pyramid, that little bit of the iceberg that's above the water is then the communication with you and your dog. Now with manners, with socialization, with obedience, that is all going to rely on your ability to communicate to your dog to be able to do so good socialization, to be able to do good obedience, to be able to teach them good manners, we have to be able to communicate with them in a language that they understand. Now, if we take a step back, if your leadership skills are poor, that informs a relationship with your dog where they don't see you as their loving leader, therefore, why would they look up to you for guidance and direction? So your communication pathway with your dog is narrow and it's filled with friction, and you're trying to communicate to them through a really tight channel, and it's hard to get that communication through. And if your dog's trying to communicate back to you, if they're trying at all, again, it's full of friction, it's full of conflict, and it's difficult. However, if we go back again and make sure that we have good leadership skills ourselves, that then it forms a relationship where our dog does see us as a loving leader, therefore, They want to look up to us for guidance and direction. That tight, friction-filled communication pathway becomes wider and wider and wider. And that allows us to effortlessly communicate to our dogs what it is that we do want from them and what it is that we don't want from them. And they can communicate back to us if we're simply willing to learn how they communicate so that we can tell them, do this, don't do that. They find themselves in a situation and they go, how do you want me to handle this? That communication flows freely between you. And that is exactly where that joyous relationship that is hard to put into words, it's hard to be able to help you understand it and taste it until you experience it for yourself. But those of you that have experienced it, those of you that have had family members that you have just seen and observed that dog and that owner in harmony with each other they barely have to talk to each other that communication almost feels telepathic because they're in tune with each other the reason they're in tune with each other is because that communication pathway is wide open and it's flowing freely the reason that pathway is wide open is because they have a relationship where the dog wants guidance and direction from their owner the reason that the dog wants guidance and direction from that owner is because that owner is a high level loving leader and if you can become a high level loving leader that builds that relationship that opens up that communication pathway and then uses that communication pathway to teach good obedience good manners and good socialization then you can guarantee that your puppy will become a dream canine companion 
And that is exactly what I want for every single one of you and every single one of you's dogs, because that means that you are happy, the dog is happy, and you are both bringing joy to each other's life, which is exactly what it should be. But far too many people end up with a dog that brings nothing but stress, frustration, anxiety, and fear to each other's lives. And that is devastating, and it breaks my heart, and never needs to be the case. But it all starts with your loving leadership. Now, I want to spend as much time as possible answering all of your questions, and you sent some amazing questions in, and I want to dedicate as much of this training to getting into the nitty-gritty of those questions. However, to be able to become a high-level loving leader, to know exactly what it is that you need to do for obedience and how you do it, what kind of things you should be socializing your dog to, when you should be doing it and how you do it, and how you go about teaching manners, it's more than we can cover in this training. So I have created my perfect puppy course. It has literally helped thousands of people be able to achieve their dream canine companion and it breaks down every single step of the way for you to become a high level canine leader exactly what you need to do and when and why we do it for obedience the same for manners the same for socialization with multiple checklists everything that you need to survive those first few traumatic nights to get toilet training spot on as quickly as possible and most people when they follow it right literally never have a toilet accident in their house never have their dog destroy anything in the house because of all of the things that we've packed into the perfect puppy course is literally everything that you need to tick off everything that we've just talked about now to thank you for joining me in this training today and because i really want you to have that success there's a special discount just for you guys today to thank you for being here in this training so again if you want to be able to become a high level canine leader and have the dream canine companion you've always wanted there'll be a link to that down below this video you can go and check that out and get started right now but that is more than enough salesy stuff for you guys right now i want to get back to providing even more value for you in this video so we're going to go over and answer some questions so jerry has asked what should i be doing on day one now again day one is is fun it's exciting it's full of emotion but what we have to remember is that i recommend highly starting as you mean to go on think about how you want to live with your dog in two years time when they're fully grown when all the cute puppiness is gone and it's incredibly difficult because they're so cute and we want to just cuddle them we want to play with them it's really difficult but we have to control ourselves and everybody in your family jerry is going to have to control themselves and treat them like they're going to be treated when they're a full-grown adult dog and the puppiness has worn off yes sneak a few pictures of them looking really cute but try and treat them and be consistent otherwise if you treat them like a puppy and you baby them while they're really young and then when that puppiness wears off and the novelty of training wears off and you start treating them like you're going too long term it's not fair on your puppy they're then confused we used to do this to me you used to treat me like this when i used to jump up you used to go oh baby boo boo and pick it up and cuddle it now you've got a fully grown labrador golden retriever german shepherd jumping up you it's a massive problem and you're getting angry and frustrated that's not the dog's fault that was your fault so with day one the fundamental principle is about starting as you mean to go on now when it comes to things like toilet training yes you should be starting that from day one and a quick tip that got time for in this video is on the hour every hour take your dog out to where you want them to go give them the chance to go to the toilet and then reward them for doing so that will start your training off really well you absolutely should be starting your obedience on day one you should be starting your mealtime manners on day one and you're even starting your socialization on day one because you're socializing them to the new environment of your new home now just to quickly refer back to the perfect puppy course all of that is broken down in incredible details with practical demonstrations for step by step that you can follow along with yourself at home that is all covered in the perfect puppy course because we just don't have time to break that down in detail in this video now samantha says should i use a harness with my puppy now that is a really interesting question and the kind of the things that you should walk your dog on if you google it you'll find 20 different answers and we've again we've tried to boil it down into a step-by-step -step process in my experience of working with literally thousands of dogs in person and helping millions of people online we have huge amounts of data and we find that the harness is one of the worst things that you can train your dog with harnesses were created for dogs like huskies to be able to pull sleds it's designed for them to, be able to pull heavily through 
the chest and then people are surprised why their dog wants to pull when they're on a harness and i completely understand you might have a normal collar or what we recommend is a slip lead when done well and again that's incredibly important and again something that we cover in detail in the perfect puppy course to make sure that you don't do it wrong because it can be done wrong but when it's done well it allows you to communicate effortlessly that communication pathway we talked about the ability to communicate with a lead is incredibly important but it's very difficult to do with a harness incredibly beautifully easy to do with something like a slip lead however that doesn't mean i'm anti-harness i have no problems with dogs being walked on harnesses when the dog is already trained and walking nicely on a loose lead but not using it to teach your dog to walk on a loose lead or putting your dog on a harness because they're not walking nicely it will just make the problem of the pulling even worse which is why it's so incredibly important to get your dog walking nicely on a loose lead nailed first time round it's just way easier to do it that way than to have to unpick loads of bad habits that definitely can and are caused every single day by the harness get it right first time round then you can walk your dog on whatever you want them to it doesn't matter because the lead's nice and loose and if you'd rather walk them on a harness I'm absolutely fine with that but I highly recommend and in the perfect puppy course we teach you about how to communicate properly with your dog in a safe fun way where the dog continues to look up to you for guidance and direction more and more and more because you're able to communicate to them effectively which is one of the fundamental pieces of the puzzle of your dog seeing you as a leader building that relationship and opening that communication pathway at the top of the pyramid now tom has asked how often do you think that i should feed my puppy now this is one of those things that you should probably speak to a vet about a kind of little disclaimer in my personal opinion you can also follow the guidelines on the dog food how i do it is i follow which is usually four meals a day however i don't simply give my dogs the food four times a day what i do is i work out how much food that should be based on the guidelines of the food that we're feeding and i take half of that food and it goes in my treat pouch i then use that food throughout the day to train my dog to reward good behaviors and what i like to do is before the meal time is use some of that food to be able to train them work on all of those pieces of obedience that we're working on all of those pieces of manners that we're working on and again we can utilize it to help our socialization go brilliantly throughout the day that way we're not overfeeding our dogs or we're not feeding them big meals and then they're not interested in food throughout the day when we're trying to use it to train but the dog's still getting exactly the right amount of food we still then do those four meal times to start with and that's where we're starting my sit stay break drill again covered in detail over in the perfect puppy course which is the single best way that you can create good manners with your dog excellent impulse control and further their desire to look up to you for guidance and direction because they understand that everything in life that is good comes through you and for them to gain access to their favorite things in life which at that age is usually food they simply have to sit wait patiently and calmly with good manners which then starts to happen everywhere else in your dog's life so feeding your dog is incredibly important and it is a huge mistake that people make by not doing it in the right way but when you do it in the right way as we teach in the perfect puppy course you will absolutely be flying with manners obedience socialization and the pyramid to success now i'm seeing that we have run out of time for questions again thank you so much for joining us i hope that that was packed with as much information as possible to set you guys up to be able to have the dream canine companion that you deserve there's a special discount to thank you for joining us today in the perfect puppy course again the link will be down just below this video i can't wait to see you there if you've got any questions want to know more about what's included again just click that link go and check it out no stress but i'm incredibly excited to see you over there and help continue this journey towards you becoming a high level canine leader that has the dream canine companion you've always wanted and remember leadership is love.